So I often have people, this is the show, folks. Welcome to the stream. This may be the point where I edit in, edit out all the stuff that happened up until now. Um, I often have people, and this has been true since we started the channel, ask me, hey, I've built this world and I've got all this cool backstory and stuff, but uh, my players don't seem to engage with it. What do I do? And obviously that's not, that's not really something I can diagnose because um, it would take a lot of time for me to, like maybe your ideas are just bad. That's, that's possible. Not all ideas are equally cool or, uh, or have equal merit. Certainly the stuff I was coming up with when I was 15, 20, 25 was pretty crap. Uh, and not, I would not have, and, and I knew that at the time, by the way, you develop skill a lot. You develop, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. You develop taste a lot faster than you develop skill. You know good stuff from bad stuff way, way, way before you can make good stuff. So it's always possible that you've got this. The reason your players aren't engaging with your campaign is because uh, the stuff that you've created isn't that engaging and there's nothing for it except to do it over and over again. That's the nice thing about being a dungeon master running D&D live with four to six other people is you can watch the expressions on their faces. And if you're paying attention and if you have empathy, you can tell what worked and what didn't work and what landed and what missed. And over time, you start developing muscles for which ideas are good ones. However... How do you tell if it's crap? It's crap if it doesn't engage people. If you read it and you don't like it, like that, that's the, like I've read my own books dozens of times, if not more, my own stuff. I read, when I send a script for the comic off to Matt and Liam, the first thing I do after I send it is I read it again. And then the next morning when I wake up, I read it again. And if the stuff in it doesn't still entertain me, if the jokes aren't still funny, make me laugh, literally laugh out loud, um, then I got to edit them and rewrite them. So that's one way. Uh, but I think that one of the problems people have is they, they are in love with the world building. That's one of the reasons we like running Dungeons and Dragons is the, one of the hooks, one of the things that makes people want to be a DM is seeing all the world building the Dungeon Master gets to do. Um, that was certainly part of it for me. I think another part, I mentioned this, I think in the last stream was I enjoyed that idea of being the guy who knew all the answers, like having the adventure, having access to the adventure. That information was like treasure. I liked the idea of being that person. Um, but certainly seeing my friend John's campaign setting that he was building, I was kind of like, wow, this is neat. You get to do all this. You get to be J.R.R. Tolkien and draw all these maps and create all this deep lore. Uh, you get to be, you know, George R.R. R. Martin and create this, the history of this world. And that's a lot of fun, and that's one of the things I think that attracts dungeon masters. But, and this is an important lesson, um, uh, the reason you are hooked on DMing has nothing to do with the reason they are hooked on playing. You may really like the world building. You may really like the challenge and sp spending hours at home drawing maps and coming up with names and, and NPCs and orders of knights and the history of your world. You may love that, but that has nothing to do with the thing the players have showed up for. The players have showed up to roll dice and push lead. The players want to kick down doors and kill orcs, right? So the trick is, and this is the subject of this video, how to take all that nonsense that you've come up with that I think anybody can do. Anybody can come up with the nonsense. The trick is then presenting it in front of the players in a dramatic way. Uh, let's see, have I, have I uh, missed anything in the chat? Every once in a while, as you know, I've got to stop and kind of go and see if anybody's... Um... That was a really tough lesson for me to learn, uh, the terrible DM says. Well, <laughs> hopefully you picked that name way back then. Uh, yeah, because remember, like your players don't owe you interest in that or the work you did on your world. I'm going to say this again because it's important. The work you have done on your campaign setting, they don't owe you anything for that. You did that work for you. I know you think you did it for them. I, I disagree. You did it for you. You did it because it was fun for you to do. You didn't need to do it. Like you can run D&D &D with just a town and a nearby cave and there's some goblins in there. Go. And what's the name of the kingdom? What's the name of the world? What are the name of the gods? I don't know. Use whatever. Use the gods from Paris Hamburg. I don't care. Right? You don't need all that stuff. You did it because you liked it. Well... That's fine, right? So the, half of this deal is not feeling as though the players are in any way obligated to like your stuff. You like it. That's the hook for you. But at the same time, recognizing that you're going to have more fun if you can get them to engage with it. And so that's going to be what we talk about a little bit. Um, P. 
people are asking questions that I don't really have answers to and will sideline this discussion. So I'm going to skip them. I apologize. Um, if man is ever going to become famous, he needs an RR. I agree. Um, stand by. Okay, so let's get kind of the meat of uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, at work, I was the, uh, I am, I still am, the lead writer uh, at the senior writer, the head writer, the only writer, at a company called Turtle Rock Studios. We just uh, a couple of years ago produced a big AAA game called Evolve. One of the things I'm proudest of creatively, maybe the thing I am proudest of creatively in my life, we created an entire universe, me and the artists and the designers, and that was just a blast. And there was a point, this is the homework, remember the homework I assigned? If you are, don't know what we're talking about as far as homework goes, hit exclamation point lore or exclamation, exclamation point writing. I could just say bang, bang lore or bang writing and you will get links to uh, the examples here. So the process of creating this universe was largely me working with the artists and the artists were coming up with characters and I would interpret those characters um, through my own lens. Uh, I was kind of the custodian of the world and I like how 50 people all type it as no, apparently none of them thinking, I don't have to do it, somebody else will do it. Um, it worked a minute ago. I think you folks may have overloaded it. Uh, yeah, no, there it is right there. So uh, Chosen of Nemelex asked a question that I'm gonna have to skip because it's not, uh, it's, it's, it would derail the conversation. So we're building this world and I'm working with the, uh, the art director who had the, one of the owners of the company who has very specific ideas of what he wants the world of Evolve to be like, the box in which he wants it to fit. But within that box, I was free to do whatever. And you know, the artist would imagine this character, design this character like Markov, for instance, and the artist working on it thought he was a space marine. And I was like, well, no, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. We already have another character who's a space marine. And that character's outfit's completely different than this one. So this character must, he can't be a space marine. Otherwise they'd be sharing similar, at least iconography. This guy's got a big uh, lightning gun. I think this character is an orbital welder. I think he's, a, he's like a, a blue collar and people really liked that idea. So it was up to, now if people hadn't liked that idea, I would have thrown it out, right? I didn't, I wasn't a, I, I didn't have the power to be a tyrant. Uh, my ideas had to, had to succeed in the marketplace of ideas with the other developers. But generally, that's how the game was being produced. And there was a point where one of the producers on the game came up to me and said, hey, we need you to write backgrounds for all the characters in the game, for the, the, the playable characters. Um, and when you write, do you find it easier to work with someone or do it all yourself? I find it easier to do it all myself. I don't think writing is an inherently collaborative medium. Um, So this, this producer was asking for lore, right? They were asking for non-narrative fiction. They wanted to know how old is this character? What's their blood type? What's their hair color and eye color? Uh, where did they go to school? Where did, like, that's the background information that you get in a lot of these games. And it's all nonsense. It's bullshit. And I said, I just said, no, I'm not doing that. I said, I'm not going to write that. And the producer's like, but the artists need that stuff. And I'm like, well, they haven't come to me and asked for it. Uh, I suspect that's something you've decided they need because maybe you worked on another project and that's how they did it there. But I, this is, I sit in and amongst the artists and we talk all the time about this stuff. Uh, but if we need something to kind of get people all on the same page, uh, you know, give me a little while and I'll come up with something. And the, the producer was like, okay, fine. Uh, so did Matt already talk about his arm? What arm? And uh, I completely agree, Mama Meat Boy, uh, that 100%. So what I did was, and I, I, I worked on this for, I don't know, like a week or so, and I tr was trying to get it done for the Christmas party, which I did. So during the Christmas party, I sent out this email. I sent the email to the entire team, and it was called Val's Story. And it was the first fiction written for Evolve. Uh, up until then, Anything I had, I, we had actually had a lot of dialogue written and recorded and in the game. We had cast actors for the characters and we had been doing a lot of writing and recording. And the knowledge of how does this world work, who are these characters, was all, none of it was institutional. It was all stored in the, in the developers' heads, 
right? It was all, you have to sit near Matt or, or sit near Phil or some of the artists. If you sat near them, then you knew what was going on with the world. If not, go ask them, go talk to them, right? We had a conference room that we didn't use for the first year and a half of Dev Element because it was just expected you would just go talk to people. So I write Val's story, and you can read it by typing slash or uh, exclamation point writing. And Val's story is dramatic. It is a narrative. It is a little short story. It takes you 15 minutes to read it. Send it to the whole team. And in this fiction, we see this uh, CIG-9 agent. And if you read the story, you find out what does CIG-9 stand for, Counterintelligence Group 9. And you get some idea of what they do and where they're based and who Val is and what her job is. What does she normally do? And she talks to her boss, and her boss is giving her an assignment. There's some mysterious stuff happening out in the far reaches of the galaxy. This is all drama. And he charges her with a directive. You need to find out what's going on with these monsters, but don't let them know that you're a spy because the people that live out on the frontier, hub agents like you, they're like the, you, they'd be set for life on the bounty they would get for you. And she's like, well, I'll just have to find some way to get them to trust me. And the next two sections of this uh, short story are about how the technique she uses to get these planet tamers to trust her. And all of that is all what a planet tamer is, right? Where this, where and when this game is set, who the heroes are, what the heroes are doing, who Val is, what her goals are, uh, who's the leader of the team, who's his second command. All of that stuff all comes out through the dialogue through tension and resolution. That is the job of the writer. And, I argue, the dungeon master. It is your job not to write the lore. Anybody could do that, and it's largely meaningless. The lore that you love so much, that you put so much work into, is meaningless. And no one, asterisk no one, is going to care about it unless you can contextualize it dramatically. Writing is, the, the writer's job is to create drama. Drama is, I can't do the thing with my hand. Let's see if we can. Tension, I can't do it. And resolution. Tense, tension, will the heroes, dot, dot, dot. How is this scene going to resolve? What is Val going to do? Will they accept her onto the team? Will they sell her out? Uh, that is writing. And to my way of thinking, it is the opposite of lore. Now, there are exceptions. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry for the long question. Also, I think you're the bee's knees. I think you are also the wasp's nipples, Reverend Juicebox. Um, how do you feel about incorporating player characters into the lore? I'm in favor of it. For example, Jerry Holkins of Penny Arcade has his C team all interwoven. Well, that's great. Don't you do the same thing in a critical role? Uh, you know, I think that's a great idea. How do we apply drama to a campaign session by session? Well, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not, I mean, apart from, so let, let me finish and maybe I can answer that question. I'm not really concerned about applying drama to a campaign session by session. I'm more concerned with trying to give you, CYZ Gaming, the tools to take the lore, the meaningless bullshit you've come up with, that we've all done, I've done it, take that meaningless bullshit we've all come up with as Dungeon Masters that we're so in love with, and find a way to contextualize it dramatically. So you can see what I did with Val's story, and you can read all of the heroes. No, well, not all of them. Many heroes have their own story. This was a huge hit, by the way. Not every single person in Turtle Rock Studios read it, but most people did. People came, people I didn't know, people that had joined Turtle Rock Studios only recently came up to me and they were like, wow, man, I read that, that was amazing, thanks, I enjoyed reading it, go write some more. Programmers that don't have anything to do really with uh, the narrative or the characters or the presentation read it and loved it and became fans of the work moving forward. So in one swell foop, I had, I had written something that if I had just done background stuff, right, if I had done what the producer had asked, some of the artists would have read some of it because they would have felt like they had to, right? I've got to read this stuff in order to understand who the character is. Uh, and that would have been unpleasant. And that's the trick is keeping your audience, whether it's the players in your video game or whether it's the players at your table, keeping them engaged. And the way you do that is by taking this information, this nonsense, you know, what is CIG9, uh, that kind of stuff, and turning it into something dramatic. Now, there were times, and we had, you know, 20 characters, and I think I wrote eight or nine stories. There was a point with one of the characters 
in somebody's background, I think it must have been Lazarus's, and this is going to be an obscure reference if you're not familiar with Evolve. In one of the characters' backstories, we talked about how um, these two characters, Hyde and Lazarus, were both veterans of a thing called the Mutagen Wars. And people were like, what are the Mutagen Wars? Right? In their backstory, in their backstory, in their, in their stories, we talked about how they're veterans of a thing called the Mutagen Wars. And that the Mutagen Wars were... There were humans on one side, and there were mutated humans on the other. And that was just a throwaway thing I made up. I didn't even know what it meant. It was now an official part of the lore of the game, but I just needed there to be this cool-sounding series of conflicts. So I came up with some nonsense and threw it out there. And like a year later, we're going through the process of making new heroes for Evolve. And my friend Scott wanted to make, um, and I, wanted to make an alien make an alien character we had all sorts of cool ideas for how to make an alien character and the uh, art director on the project super super not in favor of that however he's not a tyrant and he's like all right listen i think this is a bad idea but i'm not gonna if you guys come up with something that the team likes then i'll i'll step back and let you guys work your magic or whatever so we're working on this character who would become slim and originally he was going to be an, a legit alien not a not a basilisk soldier, not a veteran of the Mutagen Wars. But when we showed the concept art, which we were quite, quite proud of, to someone at the publisher, the first thing the publisher said, because he had read all the stories I'd written, was, oh, is that a basilisk soldier? And we all looked at each other and went, yeah, I think he is now that you asked that question. I think he is. And so suddenly I needed to know what were the Mutagen Wars? And I couldn't think of any way to do it other than I couldn't think of, you know, it's because it's so expository. It's so just blah, blah, blah. I really couldn't think of any way to do it other than to sit down and write the lore. And that's the uh, exclamation point lore link. It's what I wrote for who this character Slim is a soldier from a series of wars. They're called Basilisk soldiers. Where did they come from? What was the war about? How many wars were they? What were they, uh, you know, who won and who lost? And so it was this thing. I tried to do it dramatically, but it's not dramatic. It's very dry. It's very like Silmarillion-esque. And I felt like I was kind of backed into a corner. I felt like I've, there's nothing for it, nothing to it but to do it. And so I didn't deny. I didn't, um, you know, I didn't follow a rule just for the sake of following the rule. I made an exception when it seemed like this was a good time to make an exception. And the reason I bring it up is because at least one person on the team fucking loved it. My friend Mike read the whole thing, and I didn't, I didn't peg Mike as being somebody who really had engaged with the world of the fiction up until then, but he loved the whole thing. He read the entire thing, and I was, I was like, oh, and it was an important point. And that's the asterisk in the thing I was talking about earlier, is that the, the work that you've done, your players aren't there for that. They're, they're there because they want to kick down doors and kill orcs. But every once in a while, you get a player who really does like the lore and who really does want to read that stuff, and that's when you kind of get lucky. Um, and it's nice to have that stuff when you need it. And sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta say, well, I can't think of a good way to turn this into a dramatic moment. I can't think of a way to take these details, these world details, this lore, which generally speaking, I don't think should be exposed to the player, like running around in Skyrim, reading books. Like I think if I want to read a book, man, there are way better ways to do that than by playing a video game. Text, reading text in general in a video game, I think is a terrible, terrible experience. Um, the, and one of the reasons I think video games in general gets knocked so badly for having bad writing or bad dialogue is because the production team wants to spend the budget on writing to explain things to the player. They're terrified the player's not, not going to understand something. And that fear, being motivated by fear, causes them to take cinematics and do the least cinematic thing possible with them, explain things instead. But that should not be our goal. That should not be our job. Our job should be to find ways to introduce these ideas dramatically. I'll give you an example. There is a, um, there is a flower in The Lord of the Rings uh, called Simbulmine. And some of you may recognize it just because we're all nerds here and you've heard the term. Simbulmine is a white flower that grows only or always on the graves of the kings of Rohan. How do we know that? How do we know that? It's not because we read the Silmarillion. It's not because Aragorn and Eowyn were just riding through a field and she just points to it and then artlessly, without drama, says, oh, look, here are those flowers that only grow on the graves of the kings of Rohan. 
It's because in a scene, step one, it's a scene, it's something that happens, it's put in front of the players, let's imagine this is a D&D game, put in front of the players, two characters, right? You can see where we're going with this, it's going to be drama, uh, my right arm doesn't want to work, drama, Aragorn and Theoden, Aragorn is trying to convince Theoden to commit his armies, right? This is Joffre and uh, Sir John French, right? For God's sake, the honor of England is at stake, right? He's trying to get Theoden to commit his troops to aid Gondor because Aragorn knows that without the riders of Rohan, they're lost. They're, they, they're, they're going to lose this war. And Theoden is standing over the grave of his dead son. And that's not just a detail, by the way, especially if you watch the movie. They do a really good job in the movie, really quite a good job of writing and acting. Because Aragorn demands, he, he puts the issue in front of Theoden and says, Gondor needs aid. And Theoden wheels on him and confronts him and says, where was Gondor when the, the Eastmark fell? Where was Gondor when this other catastrophe happened? Where was Gondor when? And he stops himself. Because he's a king and kings don't. But you know what he was going to say? He doesn't have to say it. You know what he was going to say. He was going to say, where was Gondor when my son was killed? Right? And in this scene, talking about his dead son, Aragorn, trying to get him to stop being a father for a minute and be a king, there is symbolmany over the grave. And he talks about how it grows over the, over the graves of the kings of Rohan. So that's not lore, man. That's writing. That's good writing. Right? Uh, Tolkien took some meaningless piece of setting bullshit that otherwise we wouldn't care about. Except, you know, in that kind of nerdy, I just like detail for the sake of detail sense, which I think is unhealthy, generally speaking, and turned it into something dramatic and put it in front of us in a dramatic context. Uh, welcome to Egypt. Don't do the hand thing. It doesn't help visualization much and hurts you. Be safe, my dude. Don't tell me what to do. Um, so let me give you another example. How do you know what the Kessel Run is? It's not because you read the Encyclopedia of Star Wars, right? It's not because you were playing the Star Wars MMO and there was a book about runs and you opened it up to the chapter Kessel, right? It's because uh, Lucas, and I think he's going to get, uh, time will be more favorable to him. History will be more favorable to him than we have been. Uh, he, his, his, I think, storytelling breakthrough was that he knew you could just say this stuff and move on, man. So in, again, a scene which means it's put in front of us, two people, you see a pattern? Two people are arguing, so that's drama. Will the heroes, dot, 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 will Luke be able to get Han to lend them his ship? They need a fast ship because the Empire is after them and they're trying to escape the Empire's clutches. They're on the run. That's dramatic. And Han says, fast ship, you've never heard of the Kessel Run? Now, it doesn't matter what the Kessel Run is. Let's not get hung up on parsecs or whatever. Let's not get hung up on the possibility that maybe Han just kind of made that up in the moment to impress Luke because he's Luke's a farm boy. How does he know any better? That's not the point. The point is that Lucas took this little piece of setting detail, the idea of a Kessel Run, and put it in front of us in a scene with two characters coming into conflict. And it's stuck in our minds forever. It's stuck there forever because it escalates the conflict. Fast ship. Like it did the Kessel Run in 9.7 parsecs or whatever. And so you, you don't know what that is, but you're like, God damn, I need that ship now. That's a fast ship. Now we have to have it. If he had been like, well, I don't know how fast it is really. It's, um, it's pretty. It smells nice on the inside, but I don't know if it's really that fast. We'd been like, okay, well, sorry, Mr. Uh, Solo, is that your name? We'll go talk to somebody else. No, he escalates the drama by saying, oh, it's a fast ship. All right, I did the Kessel Run and blah, blah, blah. So the, my submission to you is that we as writers, all of us, this is, a, this is not a black and white thing. It's something, that, it's something that I have to work at all the time. Whenever I'm writing something, I write the Critical Role comic. Whenever I've got a chapter in the Critical Role comic that I've got to write, something has to happen. And I'm just, I just don't want to write it. I just don't want to write it. It's going to be boring. It's going to be dull. It's because I have not found a way to do it dramatically. Right? We have to up the stakes. There has to be lives at stake. Anyway. Uh, why is liking detail for the sake of liking detail unhealthy? Because I think it, it, uh, I think it's like eating nothing but candy. Uh, I think that drama is the job of the writer. 
and uh, and detail. I think seems like creating the details seems like you're doing the work, and it's it's not. It's not it, the work is contextualizing it dramatically. That's the hard work. So you think to yourself, look at all this detail I've come up with, and you pat yourself on the back and you say, what a good boy I am, poor girl. But you haven't even really gotten started yet. That wasn't important. That stuff wasn't important. What was important was finding a way to contextualize it dramatically. Um, speaking of Star Wars, Chosen of Nemelex asks, do you think some lore should be left behind the curtain rather than giving the explanation? So um, yes, although I'm not sure I would have phrased it that way. I think that every movie, every Star Wars movie after the first, we could talk about Star Wars, by the way. I've got a whole chunk on it. Um, every movie after that first movie has been burdened with the responsibility of pretending like everything they were talking about in that first movie was real. And they shouldn't do that. They should just move on to other stuff. You know, I liked seeing the Emperor as just a holographic head 30 feet tall that Vader is kneeling to. Keep that. There is no physical representation of that character that is going to be as impressive to me as that. Don't show me the Senate. That's stupid. Don't show it to me because there's nothing that's going to live up to my imagination. So, yeah, don't show. They're going to. They're obviously going to show us the Kessel Run, but they should not because it's never going to live up to our expectation. Um, so, so we should not write lore. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Like if you're, if the, if I'm, I'm saying you don't need to, uh, like for instance, my friend Ray ran D and D for me at Toro Rock Studios right before he left for arena net. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun, but I never really engaged with his world. And the reason is because he took my advice and only built enough stuff to get, to get running. Because he watched my videos and he's like, if I do it my, my way being Ray's way, I'm going to spend months building a world and we're never going to play. So I'm going to take Matt's advice and sit down and just build a town and the local environs and that kind of stuff. And I, I, I stand by that advice for new Dungeon Masters with new players. But I am not, I'm neither a new Dungeon Master nor a new player. So for me, it was tough to engage in the world because I didn't, I knew, I'm old now, and I knew that, that there, wasn't, there, there was no there there. Whereas my friend Phil wrote a 36-page setting guide and sent it to all of us, complete with illustrations and stuff, completely blown away, hooked me on the world, made me believe in it in a way I hadn't believed in some other campaigns I worked in, but I never read the thing. I skimmed it. I read a couple of pages, 36 pages. I skimmed through it, but I never really read it. It wasn't important to me to read it. I don't think Phil minded that I had read it. I think he probably would have been happy if I had. But for me, the hook was this world was real and Phil believed in it. That was the important part. You only need to write the lore necessary, I think, to get your player, to trick your players into believing that all this stuff is real. Ray did not make any secret of the fact that he had only created enough world to get started. He, he talked about it. And about how he was taking my advice. And and if I had been 15, would have completely worked on me. Uh, and if he had done 36 pages of it, I probably wouldn't have read it. I would have just been happy to know it existed. For some dungeon masters, lore is the hook. Getting to write, getting to be, I said this at the beginning of the video, getting to be George Martin, getting to be not the Beatles producer, the George R.R. R. Martin, uh, getting to be J.R.R. R. Tolkien is part of the juice. And I love that. And it's a lot of, it can be a lot of fun. It's like painting minis. Right? World building is like painting minis. It's something you can spend your weekend doing. You have music on. And at the end of a couple of hours, you've produced all this content. My point is only this. If your player is not engaging with the content, I submit to you that it may be because you have failed to present it dramatically. You have failed to take these ideas and turn them into details to a conflict happening between characters. Um... So how, how are we doing, by the way? It's, uh, we're an hour into this, and I feel like we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I haven't really been, uh, I've been talking a lot, and so therefore not monitoring chat closely. There could be a huge rebellion happening in chat right now, and people saying, do not listen to him, he's an idiot. Um, you know, uh, uh, Nibros asks, Nibros asks, how much is enough prep? And unfortunately, there's no there's no right answer to that. And I would be remiss in my duties if I were to imply that there were. Different people are going to, different players are going to key off different details. For instance, I could never really get into the Forgotten Realms. It never seemed like a real place. 
because I opened up, I tried to run it when it came out. It was a long time ago, obviously. There was no indication of where the national boundary, like who's in charge here? Is this a country? Is this just a region? Is it a duchy? Is it a dukedom? Who's in charge? If, um, if are, are there knights? Who dispenses justice? Who do the townspeople complain to? Who, how does trade happen? There's none of these details existed in that world that hasn't stopped that setting from becoming really popular. That's a very personal and idiosyncratic kind of thing. I find um, maps help a world seem real, but also don't be don't let that depress you because maps um, are hard to do if you're not a cartographer. That's why I like hexographer because it makes pretty good looking maps and you don't have to be an artist. Uh, Cake Oryx, we are glad you made it. Uh, let's see. So Blitzkrieg Karma asks what seems like a good question to me. In Critical Role, we see Matt, he means Matt Mercer, painting these very detailed explanations with pictures of rooms and situations, I think, to help us visualize that place. So do you think these details don't need to be in place to get the same involvement from the players? Um, I, I, I absolutely, well, I think, I, it's hard to say. You may have watched more Critical Role than me. I should talk to Liam and ask him about this. Is Matt providing the kind of, the level of detail that he has learned his players need? Is Matt providing more detail, really, than they need? Or have they learned what the right amount of detail is based on having him as their, in many cases, only dungeon master? I don't know. I, I certainly think that um, he he enjoys, like, I try to, um, it, this is people, we, this used to happen a lot more than it does now, thank God. Uh, people seem to have gotten over this. Comparing he and I, maybe because I'm not running a live game right now, that might be why, but comparing him and I as Dungeon Masters, and he DMs like a writer, and I DM like an actor. I don't like giving players long, pre-written descriptions of things. I like knowing things. This is something they teach you in speech debate. They teach you in forensics. is just know your subject really well, because then you can speak on it extemporaneously, and you will always be more engaging if you're doing it extemporaneously than if you're rehearsed. Right? Uh, so don't, don't try to memorize stuff. I don't write out long speeches for my NPCs. Maybe I'll do a couple of catchphrases. I know what this castle looks like, Maybe I wrote it down somewhere, but I don't I don't read it from the but he does. He often does. And especially for a live stream, I think the way he does it is better. Because me doing extemporaneously, I'm often kind of in a hurry to get past it. Uh, I'm often I'm often in a hurry to get it over with. And whereas he takes his time and engages his audience. And so I think that tends to work well for him. But I think the answer is you need to know your audience and need to know how much detail is enough, how much is too much, you know. Um, and stuff like describing rooms, that's not really, when we talk about drama, uh, that's not really what I'm talking about, I don't think. Whoa. Uh, yeah, I can sort of tell that, Orange Wolf 99 Like, that dude has a Tal'Darai campaign setting, and I, he, I probably, like, my campaign setting is just going to be a bunch of stuff for you to rip off. Here's this order of knights. Uh, here's, here are all the different uh, codices, right? There's, you've seen the, the, um, the Codex Terranosis, right? There's like at least 12 of those things. Here's the teeth of the dragon and how they work and their origin and stuff like that. Here are all the different types of monk titles, the Master of Ravens, the Master of Locusts. Those things are all going to be in my campaign setting guide, but there aren't going to be any maps or any of that stuff because I think it'd be better for you to just rip off that stuff. But you can tell, like, this is the kind of stuff that is the juice format. Um, is it okay for the GM to maim the characters? I mean... Uh, in the context you're asking, Bear Door, sure, remember that's a fantasy game and they can undo that stuff, right? Restoration, greater restoration. Um, I would not do it to screw them, though. That seems unsport unsportsmanlike. I think doing it to add a temporary bit of drama. Um, what's your view on balancing saying yes to player ideas and presenting details of your world without everything going sideways? Well, I don't always say yes. I sometimes say no. But what I try to do is try to meet people in the middle uh, and say, okay, this is what you want to do. That's weird. How about my version of that, which is this? And then listen to them and see what they think of that because they might like parts of it, not like parts of it. Let's see if we can keep the parts you like. And, you know, it's a, kind of be a back and forth and just be open to the idea of, of changing stuff uh, over time. Like if it doesn't work this week, let's try it again next week. Uh, let's see. You tread heavily, but you speak the truth. Welcome, Egypt says. Thy mother mated with a scorpion. Uh... So I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. 
Like, um, if I remember correctly, y'all, you all I mean, this is, Critical Role is maybe a bad example just because if you haven't watched it, then it, this is just like I'm making something up. But, um, you know, there was um, Clarota, who was a mind flayer, like a renegade mind flayer that the party enlisted into their scheme to go fight this beholder. And that's a great idea because there's this whole underdark in Matt's world and all these different factions and this famous beholder that they're going to go fight, uh, Kavarn. And by creating this character, a renegade mind flayer, who is probably evil and therefore at best only an ally of convenience, the players are always thinking, is this character going to betray us? But every time she speaks, every time she describes something in this world, that's it's all lore, but now it sounds super dramatic because it's coming from this dramatic character, this person they need to help them in order to find Kavar, in order to get to this beholder, but they ne they never know if they can trust, right? So whenever and when she talks about stuff, she's not just espousing random lore. She's talking about the the factions of mind flayers that were responsible for maiming her and all this stuff. That is what I mean. Is you've got this great order of knights, for instance. You've got this great dwarven, I'm doing my best to kind of come up with concrete examples. You've got this great dwarven history of this underground kingdom. Hey, let's meet a dwarf, right? Or let's meet someone who was screwed by those dwarves and hates them, right? And who needs the party to help them out. It's, I think it's not only is it very straightforward to do, um, it's fun to do. It's fun to take those parts of your world and say, okay, now I've done it. I've written the lore for it. Now let's come up with a scene Let's come up with an, come, let's invent an NPC that the players can meet and ideally like, or maybe maybe like you know that doesn't mean they have to be a good guy. They can be there can be conflict between them, but now the players are going to be like this is an interesting character. Uh, maybe he's an enemy. Maybe she's an ally, and well, the things they say, the lore that they build on that inform their character is going to have a big impact on um, on the player's perception of your world. They won't even know if you do it right. They won't even know that you're dispensing lore. That this NPC you've created has a lot of personality and has uh, this, this classic conflict in their backstory. They won't even realize that all of that is just a trick to introduce your world's lore to them. Sorry, off topic. Have you done a Xanathar's read-through? Yes. And I I'll, I'll probably put it on YouTube. So anyway. Ow. So a damage, damage Co. says, Lore versus narrative is an example of show, don't tell. Basically, yes, but no. It's kind of the opposite, actually. Did we need to see the um, the Kessel Run to know what it was? No, he just mentioned it and moved on. He just threw it out there and moved on. If he had stopped and talked about it, we would have all fallen asleep, but he didn't. It's okay to mention this stuff as long as it's in the context of a dramatic scene. Uh, so... Do you have advice for creating a pantheon for your world? Unfortunately, Enigma's Prime, I get asked this a lot. I don't know why. Obviously, there's a problem out there with people feeling as though, um, I guess because it's maybe one of the things that you're not expected to come up with classes and races. You're not expected to come up with backgrounds, but you sort of are expected to come up with gods, I guess. Um, my only advice to you is think about the culture that your characters are adventuring in and create, and think about those. I took a couple of sociology classes, super useful. Um, in fact, I think there's a crash course sociology now, which maybe I haven't watched, but might be worthwhile to check out. Think about the mores and folkways of that culture. Think about what are, what things are important to this culture. Turn those things into gods. It's the best advice I can give you. Don't ask me how to do that. I don't know. I just told you. Okay. Whew. Uh, how are you feeling, Matt? I'm, uh, I'm, I just, I'm more tired than I would be. I iced my shoulder. It's still swollen. I'm doing okay. I hope your surgery went well. Uh, how do you do deal with big info dumps of your character should know about this war, but you as a player do not? YYZ. Uh, flying into Toronto. Um, well, sometimes, again, again, this is the, uh, this is the lesson, is that it's never all one thing or the other. As, as successful as Val's story was, going back to the beginning of this conversation, and it was so successful that at one point in a meeting, talking about how we're going to open the game, evolve, like what kind of cutscene are we going to the One of the owners of the company said, let's just film that thing Matt wrote. Because it was really good, he said. It was like perfect. It was short and punchy. And I'm like, 
Chris, this thing can be 10 minutes long. We can't have a 10 minute long cinematic in front of our game. But it didn't seem like it was 10 minutes long to him when he read it. It, re- it had all the information you need all packed into it. And it was a hit. Uh, I, I did lots of those stories. However, there came a point where I decided, I made the, uh, the call to say, I can't think of a good way to do this contextually. I just need a big info dump. So I just wrote it. So sometimes in my D&D game, I'll just be like, well, you know, uh, it turns out, I didn't realize it until right now, but this this big chunk of my world's backstory is important to your character. So I'm just going to tell it to you. <laughs> right? I'm just going to get, like, rip off the band-aid. Now, one of the things I like doing is I like giving the players handouts. Uh, even, even at the table, stuff happening extemporaneously. I will text the player stuff their character knows rather than tell them because I want the player to tell the rest of the group right i want i want the players the other players to hear how graves talks about what he just learned mind reading that orc rather than me doing it so ideally i can just hand it out to them and go here here's the backstory on this but otherwise you just gotta you know you just gotta do it the fact that i don't think it's a good idea doesn't mean that i find it in all ways easily avoidable no uh let's see could we do another build the setting stream? That would be fun. I think people took the wrong lessons from the Collaborus stream. They fell in love with Collaborus, which uh, is great. It makes me happy. Uh, and people still use Collaborus. But what I wanted to do was empower people to do their own world building. As opposed to say, hey, look at this thing we created together. Let's play games in it. Um, so. So I hope through the course of the last uh, 45 minutes of babbling, my advice was useful. The takeaway is, by all means, spend your weekends and after school or after work writing in your notebooks or in Google Docs. Lots of cool backstory and history for your world. Do not be surprised, though, if your players don't seem to care much because they didn't show up to read your backstory. They showed up because they want to kick down doors and, and kill mind flares. And the trick then, therefore, is to come up with a dramatic ways to introduce these setting details, create NPCs that embody them or that reference them, uh, and then throw those NPCs into conflict with the players, and that will make it memorable. It seems like a relatively straightforward way to sum it up. Um, which means I think we might be done. Maybe it was only an hour long. What do you folks think? Have you any advice for anyone who is trying to write a setting guide for the first time? Yes. Keep it short. Uh, Phil wrote 36 pages, but because he knew he could, he had a very clear idea of what his world was like. I, I really enjoy playing in Phil's world, by the way. It's a lot of fun. It's the most fun I've had playing d d in a long time. Uh, because not only does he believe in it, and there's a lot to believe in. There's a lot of detail that he has come up with, and I know he knows it, so I don't have to. But it's also, it's really low magic. Like, we're spellcasters. I'm a cleric. Uh, my friend Steve is a, a sorcerer. My friend Jerry's a sorcerer. None of us have ever seen magic before. We are the first people ever to do this, as far as we know. As far as anybody knows. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun. So Phil did it, I think, because Phil felt like he had to do it. And if we read it, then that was a bonus. Um, I try to keep my handouts down to one page. One page, focus on the stuff the players need to know to not be surprised. Like in uh, Vasloria, which is a region of my campaign setting, Orden, it is illegal to be a dragonborn. Because dragonborn aren't these biological creatures like, you know, lions and tigers and humans. All of the dragonborn were all made by uh, the king's wizard. And then uh, somebody usurped the king and had those knights all declared outlaws. And that creates this great tension. Well, if you're going to play a dragonborn in my world, you need to know that. <laughs> Otherwise, you might not have a good time. You might get, you might feel ambushed by the setting detail. And that's not, that's not cool, man. So I try to put that stuff, all the stuff that I'm like, well, if you're going to play a dwarf, a lot of humans are going to, you know, they're going to judge you because they think all dwarves are slavers. That's not true. But that's how they, that's the cultural stereotype. Uh, so these are the things that I make sure the players know. Like, wh- what kind of stuff do you need to know in order to make a character and not later on feel ambushed by a setting detail? Okay. What are you reading right now, Matt? I'm reading a book, uh, Druid Griff, called Hero. I think it's called Hero, The Life and Times of Standby. Don't nobody go nowhere. I want to get the title right. Uh, The Wonders of Technology. 
Where is my Kindle? Here we go. It's under Kindle under A for Amazon. Hero, the life and legend of Lawrence of Arabia. I read a book earlier, and this is going to inform the next politics a book called um, Lawrence in Arabia, which was very interesting, although not, it was, it was interesting, but not well written. I didn't feel kind of dry. But Hero, uh, the life and legend of Lawrence of Arabia is super good. Reads real fast. It's fun. It's interesting. It's dramatic. And it's really, have, I think, have a big impact on the next politics video. Um, okay, so I have a question. What can I do about my players who don't really want anything, Conrad the Duck asks? Um, well, let me give you a piece of advice. I, I mean, obviously, I don't know your players, uh, Mr. Duck, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, have you given them the, dun the Dungeon Master's Guide? Have you let them read the DM's guide and look at the treasure therein and see what kind of stuff they key off of, right? Um, that's a that's something 4th edition did. It was the only edition of D&D that put the magic items in the player's handbook. But I think that's a brilliant idea. The players should have access to the, uh, to the magic items because it's one of the things that motivates them. Ultimately, if stuff like that doesn't work, Mick Conrad the Duck, that's what the West Marches is for, man. That's, that's the West Marches is a style of play Ben Robbins came up with because he was tired of his players not wanting anything. They just showed up because it was Thursday night and we played D&D &D on Thursday nights. And he's like, but what do you want to do? And they're like, I don't know, whatever. He goes, okay, well, when you folks come up with something, let me know. And that was the only way play ever happened. We did a whole video on that. Um, Wizard of War asks how to run a good sandbox. I did a video on this. There's not a good answer other than have many different pieces of content prepped and ready. And then put them in front of the players and don't prefer one over the other and see what, what give, diff, diff, give different players hooks into different, into different adventures. And then sit back and let them do what they want. Um, we're, I'm way behind on chat. So do you have any, uh, Mama Meat Boy says, do you have any dramatic techniques when you don't know what to do? Sort of like when you don't know what happens next. Yeah, I have somebody, uh, an orc attacks and I say roll initiative. Or I get the player, the players start arguing with each other. And I'm like, oh, thank God, they're arguing with each other. That means I can figure out what happens next. Um, what software tools do you use to track your setting lore campaign notes? I use Microsoft Word and a very well in indexed hard drive. So if I wanted to, if I, could, I, I could do it, if not for the fact that my typing is heavily restricted. Um, I could just, you know, if I hit the Windows key and type in Astral Celestial, I will get a list of all the documents in, in which that occurs. And I'll go, oh, that's the one I need. Could you sing Barrett's Privateers again? No command performances. Have you read Xanth? Yes, I've read the first like six or seven books. And actually, I, I quite like them. I still like them. I think they're still a lot of fun. But um, I never had, I never really had problems with the fact that uh, Xanth is a, uh, like the main character of those first couple books is a heavily misogynist kind of wang rod because it just made me want to kick him out of the story and take his place when I was, I was like 13, 14. And I think he did that on purpose. Frankly, um, any t so pseudo swag has asked this before, and I don't have a good answer, so I apologize. Any tips on how to end a session to keep players interested? I find cliffhangers hard to pull off. You know, uh, I don't know. Like, work at it until it, they're not. <laughs> there's not a trick. There's not a trick to a lot of these things other than doing it over and over again. I remember we were playing uh, in Night Below. And this is my own custom content for Night Below, which is one of the things that makes me want to kind of do my own version of Night Below and put all that stuff in there because I think it'd be a lot of fun for people to see where they come upon the uh, the Blue Redoubt, which is a 300-year-old fortress, which has since subsided from the real world into the world below. It's moved from one dimension to another. And there are these Blue Dragon Knights that have sworn an oath to defend this place. And that oath is literally what's keeping them alive. The, the power of that oath is granting them immortality through a somewhat complex process that we don't need to get into. And the players don't realize that. These, they're just, wow, who are these knights? And there was a point where my friend Phil, who's ostensibly the leader of the party, said to one of the Blue Dragon Flight, he said, how old are you? And he asked that question, and I said, that's a good place to end it. And the player's like, oh, what? <laughs> it was a cliffhanger. He just asked a question. But I knew it was a good question and that the answer was going to be... Uh, it's gonna be a doozy. So, do you do you do you do session zero as a group to make characters? We always do. We always make characters together. I think it's 
it should be required. Making characters by yourself is, I think, unsportsmanlike. Have you ever written a book based on a D&D campaign setting? Uh, not in the sense that you mean, I don't think. Do you have any advice for creating details? This is the best I can do for you, magnificent fat. Magnificent fat. People ask me about how do you name stuff? And I think built into that is that they've watched some of my stuff and they go, Matt, those are cool names. How did you do that? Um, well, first of all, go, what kind of stuff do you like the name of? Right, like, so for instance, my first day at work at Total Rock Studios, my boss, Phil, said, hey, one of the things you could be working on right now, one thing you could be working on right now, uh, since it wasn't clear exactly how, what I would be doing right away, we don't know what the name of the planet this game takes place on is. And it would be nice to just, instead of calling it Planet X, and, and I would look at some of the other stuff they'd come up with, and I'm like, these ideas are all terrible, and Phil agreed. And I was like, okay, and he said something important. He goes, I, you know, I, I like a name like Arrakis, which is the name of Dune, by the way, in the... I was like, oh, okay, Arrakis. He likes that, okay. So I did what I'm suggesting you do. I started doing research. I was like, where did he get Arrakis from? It's, it's from Al Rakis, the dancer. Because the idea is that this planet, as it moves around its star, it causes the star to, and it, like, it glitters, and it's like dancing in the... And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So there's, uh, there's it's not, um, that no one now knows that it was originally Al Rakis. Uh, Arabic. It's just, they call it Arrakis and they don't know what it's from. And that started me down the path of coming up with the, like, the idea that the first colonists here, the first uh, people that broke ground, was a Chinese corporation and the Chinese name for world, the Chinese word for world is Shirje. And I'm pronouncing that wrong, but so what? Uh, I hope it's obvious that that's not the point of this. Or maybe it is. And that then the next group were a, a Russian company who bought it from the Chinese company and eventually an American company buys it from the Russian company. And each, like the Russians heard the Chinese guys all using this term and just mistook it for the proper name of the world. And they thought, oh, that must be the name of this planet. And eventually over the course of a couple of different generations of corporations, it got shortened to Sheer. And Phil loved that. He's like, that's a cool name. He didn't even care what my process was. The fact that I could explain why it's called that made him happy, but more important was the fact that it was a cool name. It sounded cool, and people on the team liked it. Sheer, yeah, that's awesome. Good job. Uh, if the process, doesn't matter how good your process is, if it produces a name people don't like, you can't, you can't defend the name by saying, but my process was so good. Either it works or it doesn't work. We had, um, we had to name the monsters in Evolve, and that was, I mean, sort of my job, People, other people saw it as my job. I sort of felt like anybody could, if, if somebody has a really cool idea for the monster name, I didn't want to be, I didn't want people to feel like only the writer can do this stuff. We're just naming monsters. What do you guys think? Well, I had access to the text file that the game pulled from. And so I would sit there and I would come up with stuff like, we only had one monster at one point, the, uh, and the big, heavy, you know, melee fighter guy. And I was like, what about like the, the reaver and so i type that in and then we play test every day at six o'clock and now when people play i just made one change hit save submit and now when people play they see reaver come across their screen and i could hear the other people in the team going reaver what oh, okay well that didn't work uh let's try uh, what about the bruiser brawler you know i'm thinking of left for dead because we did left for dead left for dead names the smoker right stuff like that the boomer and uh, that stuff didn't work. People, I could hear them. I didn't ask people what they thought. I just listened and I was like, oh, they didn't like that. And then I was like, well, what about like um, biblical, legendary, biblical Greek um, myth name? What about like, Goliath? And I typed in Goliath and I could hear people on the team go, Goliath. And I was like, it worked. Right? I, it was trial and error. That wasn't, um, it was, I did, you don't, you don't like that? Okay, I'm just trying. What about this? You don't, oh, you don't like that? Okay, what about this? Oh, you like that? Okay, great. And over the course of, months and years you develop muscles for how to name stuff in a dramatic sense uh would you say that sheer is a good example of lore coming out in a dramatic scene well we never explain it in the game don't make that mistake we never that 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 the why it's called that you literally cannot find that out by the way playing evolve but it had to have a name so i came up with one blood Merc, i am glad you i one of the things that makes me happy about priest my, my first novel is that you can read it in about a day. Uh, that makes me happy. 
Uh, I didn't. I wanted to write a. I wanted to write a novel like the Piers Anthony stuff that I read when I was a kid, or or like Terry Pratchett books or Robert B. Parker books, where you can three hundred and fifty pages and out, and you could read it in a weekend. I hope you like the sequel. Um, what is your inspiration for new dungeon puzzles? Uh, I kind of play it by ear. It's one of the reasons I. People ask me about puzzles all the time, and unfortunately, I don't have good answers. I'm not. I'm not a puzzler. Um, I sort of. That's one of the reasons I like buying adventures, is because the guy who wrote the adventure already did that work. Uh, let's see. So I feel like we must be, yeah, that was, I'm glad YYZ caught that. It's one of the things I like about having a, a, a substantive number of followers is I can make obscure references to stuff and people will get it. Um, Pony Gamer had a long question that I'm not sure I can answer. I have a question about how to best incorporate an idea I have for my campaign with the lore of D&D. Woo! Prepositions. Specifically, are there any villains in D&D which would be more suited from a lore point of view who would be used to... What? Oh, I don't know. Like a time travel? Time travel? Um, are they... I don't know. That's a good question. Are there any time travel gods? Probably in Greyhawk. Greyhawk has a god that is a... Um, a, 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 a cowboy... Uh, there's a god in Greyhawk that is a grainy television set 2D representation of a 1950s cowboy. So who knows? Any thoughts on Pat Rothfuss's Kingkiller Chronicles? I have never read them, so no. Uh, what are your thoughts like the OSR games, like Lamentations of the Flame Princess and Labyrinth Lord? Um, I think those things are cool. That's about as far as I, I, I'm more interested in the adventures in the system. So a lot of the adventures I've checked out and would enjoy running, but I probably would just run them in fifth edition. Uh, all right, so I think we must be done because we talked about the subject. I hope, you have to imagine me putting my other hand up and bowing. I hope that I was able to take the subject about how to convert lore into writing and engage your audience. Remember, we all remember what the Kessel Run was. Uh, we didn't have to go do any research. There was no handout for it. Uh, and how to take that stuff that you enjoy doing, the kind of painting miniatures version of Dungeons and Dragons, world building, the stuff you did on the weekend before we played, and try to turn it into something that is dramatically contextualized. Uh, give these details to characters and put them in front of your players with drama, tension. Uh, I have no idea how to answer that question, Sam H. Harrison. Um... Are you going to put this up on YouTube? There's only one way to find out. It's after after I've thought about it for a while and maybe watched it back. Okay, so yeah, I guess we're done. I was thinking about uh, talk, doing some do a Star Wars chunk because those new movies, even though I really, really like Force Awakens, I loved Force Awakens, saw it several times in the theater. I loved Rogue One, saw it several times in the theater. Both those movies make me really angry, man. <laughs> make me really angry. Um, but I, I, that was not what we advertised. So uh, I do not know the answer to that question, Little Billy. I do not remember. Uh, posting your questions, C.I.H. Harrison, multiple times, unfortunately, is not going to help me come up with an answer. So I guess that's going to have to be it. It's uh, been uh, almost an hour and a half, and I am tired. I'm wiped out, still recovering from surgery. Don't know if we'll do a live stream next Saturday. We might. I'm, I'm going to download this one and take a look at it and watch it and maybe put it up tomorrow morning. We'll see. Probably. I'll probably put it up tomorrow morning. I don't know. Um, uh, so that's it. I... Uh, I, this is going to be a somewhat uh, abrupt ending, but we should always be thinking as writers, as dungeon masters, we should always be thinking of ways to create drama. Uh, not just handouts, but NPCs, uh, people. People are, people are the most interesting thing out there. Uh, and if you can take those bits of setting lore that you've come up with and put them in a character's mouth and make them important to an NPC or one of your PCs, then I think you've gone a long way toward engaging your audience. So that's it. Uh, we are going to stop. And this will probably be on YouTube, if not later tonight, early tomorrow morning. And maybe I'll see you folks next Saturday night uh, at 6. I don't know. I'm not sure. It depends on whether or not I can come up with anything to talk about. Thanks for hanging out. If I didn't get to your question, I apologize. Peace. I have to do it left-handed. Out. <laughs>